Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm your host, Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, and welcome. If this is your first time tuning in, a very special welcome to you. I'm excited to tell everybody we are now celebrating our one year anniversary here with the show. We're having thousands and thousands of downloads and listens. And I can tell you why that is, folks. It's because I have been having on the show, and you know this if you've been tuning in for any length of time, I've been having some amazing guests on the show. And of course, today is no exception. I'm so excited to have my guest today, Mr. Matt Terrio. And let me tell you just a little bit about Matt in case you're not familiar with him, and then we'll bring him on. So first of all, Matt is the founder and creator and host of the very popular podcast show, Epic Real Estate Investing. And he founded that back in 2010. And I tell you, folks, what a superstar Matt is. He's had over 6 million downloads since he started the show uh, in 2003. And he, uh, back to the beginning of his story, and he'll tell you more about it here in just a second. He got out of the rat race. He was uh, making $7 an hour bagging groceries way back in the day. But since that time, he's built his own real estate investing empire. He's the uh, author of two best-selling books, Do Over and Epic Freedom. Matt's mission in life is to help people to broaden their horizons with faster, easier routes to get them to success. With that, my friend and colleague, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm so excited to have you on, Matt. You've got quite the story yourself. So before we get into and by the way, folks, be sure and stay to the end of the show because Matt's going to be giving away absolutely free his phenomenally successful real estate investing course. And you'll find out how to get that course for free at the end of the show. But uh, Matt, if you would take a few minutes and just give people your background story, uh, how it is that you even got into real estate investing. I know you were bagging groceries for seven bucks an hour way back when, but tell my audience your story. We're awkwardly. It wasn't that long ago. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. When I got out of the Marine Corps, I spent the next 12, 13 years of my life in the music business and did very well for myself all through my twenties and crept into my thirties. And when this little thing called the digital download came along. It just kind of turned that whole industry upside down. And just before the $7 an hour, it was seven figures that the previous year. So it was quite the uh, transition and quite the adjustment. <laughs> wow. But, yeah, I, was I, I didn't years know old. you and I had that income. I'm a uh, composer and big time into music as well. Big part of mine and my wife's life. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, you know, I had a small little record label, but we had major label distribution and you know, when people stopped buying CDs in exchange for free downloads, it just, it kills the business model, right? And I don't know, I don't know if today they still have it totally figured out. It was the, the damages reverberated pretty far. Anyway, I didn't know how to do anything else. And when I went out looking for a job, I found I wasn't really qualified for anything else. And I ended up bagging groceries and did that for about six months, trying to figure out what was going to be next. I knew I had to learn something new. And I really missed my money. And I thought, uh, well, if I have to learn something new, what's going to give me the biggest income earning potential? And of all the people to point me in the right direction, it was the grocery store manager who said, Matt, if you want to uh, get your money back, real estate, it's the final frontier where the average person has a legitimate shot at creating real wealth. And at that moment, that was all I needed. I didn't know if it was true or not, but it was the best advice I'd had up to that point in the last six months. So I went and made a, did what I thought the logical thing was to do and went and got my real estate license, became a realtor. And it only took me four years to figure out that uh, if this is where the money's at, I'm sitting on the wrong side of the desk. (laughs) (laughs) And so I uh, made this investment in my education, a rather large investment, and just did something that they called move at the speed of instruction to, to outpace your doubts. And I just took that philosophy and went forward and I got the the one little book. I don't know if you've heard of it or not. It's called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Oh, yeah. (laughs) In my live events now, I say, raise your hand if you haven't read it, rather than raise your hand if you've read it before. Right. (laughs) And I just got the concept. I really embraced the concept of passive income, this rat race escape strategy and getting your passive income to exceed your monthly expenses. And in the music business, I had made a lot of money. I did really well for myself, but I was really only as good as my last release. 
I kind of equate that now to fixing and flipping. Like you're only as good as your last flip. And now you got to go find another one, do it all over again. And that was just such a painful experience at the age of 34 years old of having to just, I mean, essentially hit rock bottom financially. And I was like, I'm never going to do that again. So this new concept, it just really resonated with me. That message of through Rich Dad, Poor Dad and Escaping the Rat Race, it really resonated at the right time. And so I kind of pushed aside all the fixing and flipping strategies and really opted in. Let's just get create passive income. So I'm always protected. I'm always safe. And if all goes to hell, at least I know my bills are going to be paid. And that probably about three and a half, almost four years, I was able to achieve that to get my passive income to exceed my expenses. And I was financially free. I wasn't rich by any means, but I didn't have to go to work, which was a really, really good feeling. And when your network, your friends and your family start recognizing, wow, you were just bagging groceries a few years ago and now you're playing golf on a Tuesday. Like, can I pick your brain? Can we have some coffee? Uh, can I take you to lunch? And recognize that, hey, maybe teaching this is the next step for me. And that's kind of where we are today. So we've got three heads to our business. We have a, a DIY service where we'll show you how to do it yourself. Then we have a, a done for you service and we have a do it with you service. That's great. I love your story, Matt. And you know, when you said a moment ago that, you know, when your passive income exceeded your expenses, you said you weren't rich, but, mm -hmm. and I get that you weren't rich with a, with a, you know, a big checking account at the time, but you were like very, very wealthy because I mean, after all, so many people coming in wanting that are interested in becoming real estate investors, at least it's been my experience what they're looking for is the freedom. Mm -hmm. It's what they're looking for. And when you had, when you established the passive income to exceed your expenses, that's what you had achieved. I mean, freedom to do what you want, when you want, with whom you want. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't get, I mean, in my opinion, it doesn't get any freer than that. Right. You know, I kind of equate freedom as, or a synonym for freedom as just having a life of options, right? And I had the option. When the alarm clock went off, I could roll out of bed or I could just roll over is how I put it. And uh, that was a nice option to have every single day. I love it. I love it. Well, I love tuning into your podcast. In fact, I strongly encourage my audience, viewers and listeners, when we finish the show, if not right now, you can, you know, multitask. Go ahead and subscribe to Matt's podcast. It is amazing. I get notified every time you have a new show come out yourself. Once again, folks, it's epic real estate. It's just amazing. And you give so much value and so much content. On one of your recent shows, you talked about the three pillars, and I'm paraphrasing what you said, but the three pillars to being successful in real estate investing. And those three pillars that you said were attracting, converting, and then exiting. And then on your show, you really drill down to the different parts of attracting, converting, and exiting. Attracting had three parts. Converting had two parts. Exiting had three parts. Do you mind taking a moment? Let us drill down on, on that, those three pillars and that philosophy of yours. I love the foundation. Yeah, sure. And thanks for saying that because we do a lot of lists on the show. And I was like, uh-oh, I'm not going to remember this list. <laughs> but thanks for that. Uh queuing that up for me but yeah that is that is the pillar of a real estate investing business the three pillars of a real estate investing business first you have to be able to attract opportunity or attract leads is what we look at and because if you can't attract you're not going to have any opportunity so that's where it all begins and there's three elements of attracting and one is is finding the problem second is promoting the solution and three is automating that process so to really create consistent opportunity, you have a, need to have a, what we call a lead machine that produces leads on a regular basis. So that's the first part. Then once you've got the lead, then you have to, to convert that lead into a contract. And the way that we do it, when the leads that we're attracting, these are people with problems. That's the only way you're going to get, ever get real estate at a discount is that owner has to have a problem. Nobody in their right mind is going to just give their real estate away. And so when the person with the problem is calling you, you have to be really good at building rapport. They're calling you, they're scared, they're nervous, they're not in the best place in life at that moment. They've got problems that are even bigger than selling the house and they just need a, a quick, easy sale so they can get on with their life and get on with their business. 
So you got to be good at building rapport. You have to be good at presenting the offer so that they understand what the offer is and how it's going to help them. And then third, you got to be really good at asking for that signature. So those are the three things. So once you've got that converted, this is where you really make your money in, in real estate is when you go from the attracting the lead to converting the contract. You've heard that before. You make your money when you buy real estate, right? Correct. Because if you can't convert, you've got no control over the deal. So the third pillar would be to exit. So if you make your money when you buy, you get paid when you exit. And there's three types of exits. You can flip, you can hold, or you can finance. So flipping is where you create the piles of cash. Holding is where you create the streams of cash. And if you do the financing right, you can get the best of both worlds. And if you can't do that, then you can't profit. So all three pillars are essential to make the whole thing work. Yeah. So when you say finance, you're referring to actually taking a note back and seller financing and actually being the bank for the buyer of your uh, property. Is that right? Yep. Being the bank. Right. Ultimately, what I've found, like, there's a lot of money in real estate. I mean, it's created more wealth than anything else on the planet. But you start to, to play the game and you start to recognize that the money is in the money, right? Yeah. You, you, you need the, the real estate to, to fight off Uncle Sam a little bit. But yeah, the money is, is really in, in the money. Well, and, and I'll comment on that. I know firsthand the money's in the money because I've been in the business now 15 years. And the first five years, I relied totally on traditional financing for my houses, the local bank, the mortgage company. I mean, I wasn't even using hard money back then. And of course, when I talk private money, I'm not talking hard money either. But anyway, those first five years, I was relying on the local banks and I got cut off with no notice, 2008, 2009. And I wasn't the only one. I mean, I had a perfect credit score, never laid on a payment. And so when you say the money's in the money, I know that firsthand because I was introduced to this wonderful world of private money within two weeks of being cut off from the banks. And Matt, the reason I know the money's in the money because my business tripled the first year right after being cut off from the banks because I had access to unlimited funding for my deals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I know about money being in the money. Now, the first pillar that you talked about was attracting mm -hmm. or having a lead machine. So let's take a few minutes because I know my audience, I mean, whether they're wholesalers, flippers, it doesn't matter. Everybody's looking for the deals. All right. the real estate investors want to know, where in the world do I find these deals? And of course, there's, you know, tons of ways to find deals, but you know, what worked two years ago may not be working exactly so well today. What are your top ways that you are finding the deals today? Well, weirdly, in this weird world of, of high tech that we live in, direct mail is still number one. If you've got the budget and you can do the quantity that's needed, direct mail is, is just still works really, really well. What we've done since because there's a lot of people out there in real estate now and a lot of people have gone to to little seminars and listen to the podcasts and, and watch webinars and there's a lot of people out there sending direct mail to to people and so the, the response rate has gone down a little bit so it's increased the cost per deal a little bit but what we've done is we've integrated our our direct mail our offline marketing with online marketing as well so we want to make sure that anytime we do any sort of marketing that we're able to capture the seller's information. And we can now do that obviously with the phone number. That's really easy to do with the call capture service. But we're getting great results with our texting service. So you can text offer to 5678, for example. And the thing that's working really well, surprisingly, is I don't know if it's a surprise, but it is, it's rather new to us in the last year, is we'll drive people to a website, will be our call to action. And we'll do something called pixeling them and we'll have a cookie attached to their browser. And we get to follow them around the internet, just like Amazon follows us all around all day. And we get to keep our, our messages in front of them that way. And kind of the, that three-headed monster approach of uh, staying in front of the seller is what's generating most of our leads right now. But it's a combined effort. I love it. So when you say pixel, uh, you're talking about retargeting, right? Absolutely, yep. All right, excellent. Well, I tell you what, you just shared a strategy that I haven't heard anybody else share and talk about. And that is your call to action to a potential seller. The call to action being 
for them to text mm. for uh, in other words, that's the way they're raising their hand instead of call this number text yep you know four five six seven eight so let's take a moment and drill down on that so you know your direct mail or your postcard or your facebook ad or whatever mm -hmm. and then the call to action is text whatever for an offer so they text it and i'm assuming that text that they send goes to a some type of online service you have right yeah well it sends it texts them with the link hey i got just got your request for an offer click this link provide me answer a few questions for me and we'll get it over to you in the next 24 hours Got you. So they text it and then that shoots back to them. What a link for them to click on. Correct. Correct. And then now that we have the phone on, we can follow up with them with, with as many texts as we want. We can follow up with them. It's, it's called sales message, or we can actually send a video to their phone of us talking. And then we can also follow up with what's a, called a ringless voicemail. Right. So we'll, we'll have all three of those things connect with the person until uh, they provide the information and we can get them the offer that they're looking for. I got you. I got you. You know, one thing that I'm exploring that I want to test and I haven't done it yet. And that is I'm hearing a lot of my colleagues and, and high end real estate investors across the nation doing more and more outbound cold calling. Mm -hmm. Have you got any thoughts or comments on that strategy? Yeah. I mean, I think everyone shifted to that when, because they became so dependent on direct mail and when the, direct mail started to get saturated. I mean, I've got, shoot, I've got 50 rentals of my own. So I get a lot of direct mail because I'm an right. absentee owner, right? So I'm I not on it. Too. I got, yeah, so. In fact, I got one in the mail yesterday. Yeah, right? <laughs> so here's my question is, have you received that card or something that looks very similar to it before? Sure. Yeah, exactly. So you get the same, if everyone's ordering their mail from the same four or five places, so you get the same four or five postcards over and over again. And I think when that stopped, being as effective because I think sellers became blind to that messaging. They, you know, they resulted to actually picking up the phone old school style and started calling again. Yeah. But I don't like it. I had my days of being the cold calling cowboy. Right. I, I don't uh, look back on those memories fondly. Well, well, I, well, I can tell you as I explore it and test it, it will not be me doing the outbound calling. I'll right. tell you that. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> we'll, yeah. We will definitely automate that process. Now, on one of your shows, uh, Matt, in fact, on a lot of your shows, you're big on the topic of integrity. You talk mm -hmm. a lot about integrity. And one quote that I heard you say recently on one of your shows is you asked the question. I think you may have been at one of your live events on stage when you asked the audience the question, where would you be if you did everything you said? Mm -hmm. Which I found to be a powerful question. But can you take a moment and explain why did you ask your audience that question? I asked them that question because I think it's the most, the most powerful place to operate from as a human being is to take responsibility for your own results. Good or bad, you are responsible. There, there's very little out there that's out of or beyond your control. You know, everything you have today is, is really a... Uh, a culmination of all the decisions that you've made up to this point. And when it comes to, you got to be really careful. This is, I'm, I'm going to answer this very carefully because I have a little bit of a pet peeve when a company or a person says that they have integrity because I immediately go on, oh, no, you don't, <laughs> right? That's my immediate radar. And everybody, how my little red flags go up. And no one really has integrity. Either they are in integrity or they are out of integrity and people waffle back and forth. The high performance, high achievers just have managed to stay in integrity more often than they're not. And that integrity being is saying what you're going to do and then doing what you're going to say for no other reason than you said you were going to do it. And if you think about where you would be of, of all the things that you said you were going to do, then you look back on how little of that you actually did right? And then you start thinking about, well, gosh, if everybody I interacted with, if they did everything that they said they were going to do, look how far I'd be as well. But just look how much better that the world would work. So I, I go through that process at, at our events right in the beginning because they are at my event because they have yet to get what they were looking for out of real estate. I just want them to recognize that whether it's my program or your program or someone else's book or someone else's video, like it all works. 
it's you, the human being, that's bringing the variable to that equation, and to take responsibility for it. And you know, when are you when are you actually going to do something about it? Because it's completely in your control. And so that's that's why I think that conversation of integrity is important. Not for me from a, a business, and and you should trust my business more that you should trust yourself. Excellent. Well, as you were talking, it reminds me of something that I've shared with my students in the past. And that is, I say, you know what? If you just show up, <laughs> just show up, yeah. just show up. You've left the herd behind. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of my, you know, I'm in a small area, Matt. I mean, my total target market's only 40,000 people. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm blessed that in that 40,000, I'm the most consistent real estate investor around here. So I don't have that many other people show up putting bandit signs out. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give an example right now of what you just said about integrity and just, you know, being responsible and, res and being, and being responsive to your own marketing that you're putting out there. So every once in a while, someone will show up that, you know, there, there'll be some, guru that comes to town 90 minutes away and now i'll see these bandit signs popping up we buy houses we buy houses mm -hmm. and i have the most fun matt i call the numbers leaving my message saying i've got houses for sale not one but plural and it's the truth i have mm -hmm. houses for sale mm -hmm. and if i get a fourth of them one out of four maybe one out of five to call me back Yep. I'm lucky, right? Yep. yep. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, just, just follow up. Another thing that I heard you say on one of your recent shows, and I quote, you said, real estate is easy. What's hard is what's in between your ears. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me of, of something uh, that I have said in the past, and that is it's hard to really own or control real estate out here until you own or control the real estate in between your ears. Sure, sure. But I want to know, what do you mean by that when you say that? Why is real estate easy and what's in between your ears hard? Well, I mean, I could show anybody how to fill out a purchase agreement inside of 10 minutes, right? In this blank, you put this, and this blank, you put that, and this blank, you put that. But why you don't get up and do it every single day, that's on you, right? You know how to do it. Now it's up to you to do what you know. And so that's really the, the, the famous quote from uh, Wolf of Wall Street when he said, the only thing between you and everything that you want is the BS story that you keep telling yourself up here, right? Right. And that's the story that you tell yourself. That's those six inches of real estate in between your ears. And if you can control that, then you can control any physical real estate. What do you think is the number one thing that holds people back? I think there's two things with regard to real estate. It's one, they don't believe real estate works. They just don't believe it is works. They, they have some sort of doubt whether it's conscious or subconscious. And the second thing is they don't believe that they work. So that's where the real doubt comes from. You know, the, the famous personal development quote or question is, what would you choose to do if you knew you wouldn't fail? And everybody picks something that they're not doing, right? Because they don't believe that they can do it. And I think real estate is no exception. Beautiful. I love it. I love it. And of course, my audience is varied. I've got a lot of uh, viewers and listeners that are seasoned real estate investors, but I also have a lot that haven't done their first deal yet. Mm -hmm. And so what's the best advice, the top one or two or three uh, pieces of advice you can give to a brand new real estate investor that has yet to do their first deal? Mm. There's a bunch there, but let me see what's most important. I think the first thing is, I think to, to be intentional about creating your environment, I think is a biggie. Now, what do you mean by environment? The people that you associate with, the people that you connect with. If, you, if you're an entrepreneur of any sort, and then if you're a, a real estate entrepreneur, it can be a really lonely world. There, You've got a lot of, people that are more than willing to give you advice and tell you what to do and what not to do. But sadly, none of them are actually taking their own advice. So you're taking, getting bombarded with all of this information that from people that don't have, know how to do what it is that you want to do. So I think one, you need to be intentional about creating your environment and look for the doers in this world. Look for people that have the life or are living the life or doing what it is that you want to do 
and become a value to them. So they're more inclined to assist you and help you. So many people go out and looking for what can you give me? You know, what can you do for me? And if you just kind of flip that equation and say, uh, hey, Jay, what can I do for you? And if you don't know, then it's my job to figure out what it is that you do need and what I can do for you. And I think that that's the best approach. And the second thing I would think is just move at the speed of instruction. You don't need to know everything before you get started, right? The, uh, you know, Martin Luther King had said, uh, you don't need to see the whole staircase to take that first step. So I think that's really key. And the third thing that probably holds people back a lot, at least what they say holds them back is, but where am I going to find the money? Right. And I think what people don't realize is when you get really good at finding deals, and it doesn't take any money to find deals, it doesn't take any money to get control of those deals. And what people don't realize is once you've got control of a deal, once you've got a property under contract, you actually have the leverage in the relationship. There's no shortage of money in the system right now that's looking for a good deal. There's no shortage of money out there looking to place their money somewhere. And if you've got a good deal, the money is really, really easy to find. So don't stop yourself from uh, going out there and taking action because you don't know where you're going to have find the money if you get the property under contract. So those are a few things that, that come to mind right away. Yeah, well, it's excellent advice. And I know firsthand uh, on the money, I mean, I've, I've got people knocking on my door right now say, I mean, I've got a good problem. <laughs> and yeah. that is money sitting on the shelf waiting to be deployed. And I tell you, you know, when you got money sitting on the shelf waiting to be deployed, it, it, the confidence level even goes up even more, but you're right. I, I love your, I love your quote of uh, move at the speed of instruction. You know, <laughs> I am not a thinker brain. I'm a reptile brain mm -hmm. and bless my friend's hearts. The engineers that they got to think it all the way through that never end up taking the action. So excellent advice. When it comes to books, you're an author. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you got more books that you're getting ready to uh, release, but your, your two books, Do Over and Epic Freedom. Can you give us just a little overview summary of what those two books are about and why people might want to get those? Sure. Well, well Do Over is kind of half autobiographical, half personal development. And it was all stemmed from the Mark Twain quote, learn from other people's mistakes because you won't be here long enough to make them all on your own. <laughs> and, and as I had to do over in life, I had to start life over at the age of 34. I had made my millions before I was 30, not millions, but I made a million before I was 30 and lost it. And then I had to start all over again. And so I had to do over. So I want to make sure that I wasn't going to make the same mistakes the second time around as I did the first time around. And, you know, you kind of go from music business into real estate and like those seemingly have nothing to do with each other, but they're both a business and they're both very much have to do with each other. So that's really what that book is about, Do Over, and how, to, how I uh, recreated myself and heeded all the mistakes I made previously. And then uh, Epic Freedom is it's a really short, quick read. It's all just about the, the two fastest strategies to a paycheck in real estate to put some money in your pocket so then you can really start building something meaningful. Speaking of books, my best guess is you're an avid reader would be my guess. I, I do. Yes. What types of books do you like to read? That's part one of this question. What kind of books do you like to read? Part two of the question is what book has had or books has had the most profound effect on your life and your experience of transformation? Got it. I think lately I'm really into books that are looking into the future. Maybe I'm really hypersensitive to it because of how the digital download crushed the industry that had been around for, you know, uh, almost a century, right, of selling audibles. And so now I'm looking forward and I'm being more open to what's going on in the future. Like, so I'm always looking into, you know, I'm interested in the blockchain. I'm interested in cryptocurrency and where that's going to go. I don't want to be on the outside looking in when that happens. I'm not a big speculator, so I'm not a big advocate of it either. I just want to be aware. I'm looking at all the how, um, the, the cell phone is becoming the center of our life and it's what has people's attention. So stuff like TV and, and radio advertising are becoming less and less effective, even though they're just as expensive as they've ever been. I'm looking at the sales process. I'm looking at what Amazon is doing. I'm just the retargeting thing, the way, the things that you can do. So I'm always really into the future with what, with what I'm interested in reading right now. But I would say the biggest, the book that's had the most profound is probably two. One would be Tony Robbins, Awaken the Giant Within. I've, amen brother amen that was just i think that 
I mean, that book was written like 30 years ago. And I think uh-huh. it's just as valid today as it was then. And I've read it probably 11 or 12 times. I was reading it once a year, every year for a while. And the second one is a book called The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. It's a short I haven't story. heard of that one. Tell us about it. Dar- Darren Hardy kind of copied it, I think. And may- he, he became a little bit more famous with it called The Compound Effect. Right. Right. But uh, The Slight Edge was first. And that uh, just how every decision you make matters. And especially the small ones. And when you make that small decision consistently, it can have a very impactful or yeah, create impactful results in your life for the good or the bad. And what a lot of people do is they think these small little decisions don't matter. And it's it's every decision matters. And that's uh that's really been a, a profound philosophy of my life is I've I've done over after the music industry. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Well, Matt, we are out of time and I don't want to stop. In fact, you are so intriguing. I want to have you back on the show uh, again sometime in the future. But before we go, I know my audience is going to want to continue the conversation and to connect with you. We mentioned right up front at the beginning of the show that you've got a free, your free real estate investing course you're going to give away. So uh, please give that information out and how people can get that course and connect with you. Sure. So, I mean, coincidentally, you'd ask me what are the, the things that hold people back and from getting started, getting their first deal. And that's a, that's a frequent question. And a lot of times it comes to me in the form of, you know, if you lost everything, how would you start all over again? So I've been asked that question so many times that I just created a course around it because I did get started with nothing. And so I, I created a, a course on how to do real estate with little to no money. And I think the big there's a lot of different courses with that type of label around it and doing the real estate, which you may know, especially if you're an, if you're a private money expert, then you know, you don't need a lot of money to do the actual real estate, but to go out and run the real estate investing business that can take some capital. So I'll show you how people how to do both sides with little to no money. And you can get the copy of that at free real estate investing course.com. Perfect. In fact, I'm going, I'm going to have, put, I'm going to put right up here on the screen uh, for those that are watching uh, the video uh, on uh, our YouTube channels. So uh, one more time, I'm pointing to it right now, Matt, but you say it one more time for those that are listening. Sure. Free real estate investing course.com. Awesome. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. And uh, man, what a breath of fresh air. Any final parting comments before we call it a wrap? Final words and parting comments. Yeah, I say uh, cash flow is king. Watch out for flipping and wholesaling properties. That can be a trap. Go for the cash flow and you'll be out of here faster than you know it. I love it. Thank you so much, Matt. Look forward to being in touch. And to all of our viewers and listeners, thank you for tuning in to Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm Jay Connor of the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. And here's to taking your real estate investing business to the next level. Bye for now. We'll see you on the next show. Bye-bye.